In, in this screencast, I'd like to talk about um, one of those articulatory processes that we find in the phonetics chapter of the course. Um, and in particular, it's the process of assimilation, which is um, probably one of the trickier concepts in the entire course. So I thought it was worth revisiting and reviewing in the screencast today. Um, so articulatory processes are ways in which we change the way we say words or ways in which um, the pronunciation of words changes over time for example um, and this is the uh, way that these articulatory process questions are presented where you're given two different pronunciations of a word and in the first one it's just the very very basic pronunciation as if you were saying sounds in isolation um, and not really um, articulating in a normal fashion. The second version of articulation of transcription here is more like the word would be in actual pronunciation when you were speaking in your normal conversational way and then we have the interaction of phones together within a word. So when we are doing um, uh, identifying the articulatory processes, we have to look to see how are the two different pronunciations different. And in this case, we have three differences. We have the L is different, where in the first one it's a regular L, and in the second pronunciation it's um, an L with a little circle underneath, which I'll explain in a few minutes. The second difference is that the vowels in the second version have the tilde on top, which means they've um, got some air coming out the nose on the vowels. And then the third difference is the articulation of the first nasal in the word, where you go from an N to an ng sound. So here's a, a list of those three differences. Now when we are um, looking at a change in a phone, where a phone just changes to become slightly different, or a slightly different phone, um, we, we need to make sure we understand what the difference actually is between the two phones. So in these cases, we need to understand the extra little symbols, those diacritic symbols, um, in the first two and in the last one, we need to get out our charts and make sure we understand the difference. So the L, how is this L changing? In the first instance, we have an L that is just a regular L, as we would expect. And in the second pronunciation, we have an L with a little circle underneath. That circle is a diacritic that indicates that a sound that is regularly a voiced sound has become devoiced. So L being a liquid, which means it's a sonorant, it's at the bottom half of the chart, is a typically voiced sound, like all of the sonorants. But if you see a little circle under the L, that indicates that this sound has been devoiced. So the voicing has been kind of stolen away, and what is a regularly voiced sound turns into a voiceless sound. So we'll we'll look for some motivation for that when we um, when we return to to the L case. In the second case, we have a vowel, or in this case, two vowels that have little squiggles on top, those tildes on top. So we have two vowels that have become nasalized. That's what the, the tilde means, that it's a nasalized vowel. That means we allow a little bit of air out of our nose as we articulate the vowel. Most of the time we don't want to have a bunch of air escaping out our nose unless we are doing one of those nasal consonants, that mm, mm, or ng mm sound. But sometimes we do allow a little bit of air out our nose on the vowels. So again, we'll look to see what the motivation for that is in a minute. The third change is the alveolar n sound turns into a velar ng sound. Now, if we are looking for um, assimilation, we always have to identify whether, in fact, it is a case of assimilation, or could it actually be a case of dissimilation? Now, assimilation is much more common because assimilation is uh, an efficiency process. It, assimilation makes our speech much more efficient because assimilation is where a phone changes to become more like its neighbors. So there's some feature of articulation um, of some kind of phone and that feature spreads over onto another phone, one of its neighboring phones, and so it becomes easier to say the sequence of these phones when they share some kind of feature. Dissimilation, on the other hand, is where phones become less like each other. And usually dissimilation is, is, requires more effort or energy. 
and so we don't find dissimilation happening very often at all. Most of the time we get assimilation. But basically whenever we see a phone changing into another phone we have to decide is it assimilation or dissimilation? Does the phone change to become more like one of its neighbors or less like one of its neighbors? Now in the case of the devoiced L, we have this phenomenon in English where we devoice liquids and glides if they come immediately after an aspirated P, T, or K. So the motivation for devoicing this L comes from the P in front of it where the voicelessness of the P somehow carries forward through the word onto the L. So this is definitely a case of assimilation where the L changes to become more like the P because now they are both voiceless sounds. And whenever we're dealing with um, with assimilation, part of the complexity of assimilation is that we have to identify three aspects of assimilation. The last one is the fact that it is actually assimilation. And in the first slot there of our answer, we have to indicate the direction of the assimilation. And we have either a forward moving assimilation, which we call progressive assimilation, or we have kind of a backwards moving assimilation, which we call regressive assimilation. So when I'm trying to identify the direction of assimilation, I like to use arrows where I start out with the phone that is motivating or triggering the change and then I draw an arrow towards the phone that actually gets changed, it has some kind of influence on it. So in this case, the arrow moves forward through the word because the voicelessness carries over on to the L. Um, in fact, the devoiced L is a result of the same phenomenon that creates the aspiration on the put or k, that voice lag where we delay narrowing the glottis for the voice sound that comes after it and we have this little puff of air that comes out and it also delays the voicing on the liquid or glide that comes next so we get the devoiced liquid or glide. So in this case we have progressive assimilation and in the middle slot we have to identify the type of assimilation. So what type of change takes place going from a regular L to a devoiced L? We're changing the quality of voicing. Now voicing is kind of a generic term where we use the voicing to refer either to going from a voiced to a voiceless sound as we do in this case, but we can also use voicing assimilation to account for the opposite, going from a voiceless sound to a voiced sound. So we just use that generic voicing assimilation. Okay, moving on to the vowels. Uh, here we have nasalized vowels. And again, we have a case of assimilation. Why are we nasalizing those vowels? Well, it's to match the feature of the following nasal consonant. And we have this phenomenon in English where typically vowels that occur immediately in front of a nasal consonant, so that's a m mm sound, an n mm sound, or an n mm sound, any of those nasal consonants will exert an influence on the vowel in front of it and that vowel becomes nasalized because our brain anticipates the nasal and knows that we need to drop the velum at the back of the roof of our mouth there, the velum at the back, uh, in order to create a nasal consonant. We drop the velum momentarily and then that allows air to go up to our nasal cavity and out through the nasal passage. And so um, we are just kind of getting a head start on the nasal and we drop the velum while we're still articulating the vowel and we allow a little bit of air out our nose on the vowel. So again we have assimilation. Um, this time though the direction of the assimilation is the opposite direction where it's kind of backwards through the word um, going from a sound later in the word onto an earlier sound. And this is the direction that we call regressive assimilation. And then the type of assimilation in this case is going from a regular oral vowel, as we would call it, and we turn it into a nasal vowel. So this is called nasal assimilation. The third case is changing an n to an n. So if you have your charts in front of you, you'll see that uh, n is an alveolar nasal, whereas n is a velar nasal. So in order for this to be another case of assimilation, the alveolar would be changing into a velar to become more like some other velar sound in the word. And in particular in this case, it's the influence of the velar 
stop the k, the voiceless feeler stop in front of it. So we have quite often in, in English these these nasal stop clusters, like nk. And um, if those the nasal and the stop are sharing the same place of articulation, that's a much more efficient cluster to pronounce. So for the ng sound, we get the back of our tongue up to the velum, and then it's already in position for the k. Then to create a k, all we need to do is drop down the tongue, release the stop, and then we have a k sound. So that transition is much more efficient than the plan king example, the, the transcription number one there, where you go from an alveolar nasal into the velar stop. Because then for the alveolar, the tip of the tongue has to be up to the alveolar ridge, and then you have to drop that quickly and bring the back of the tongue up to the velum and then drop that again for the releasing of the K, and it's much more um, it requires more effort and is less efficient. So again we have a case of regressive assimilation where it's the influence of the K and that exerts an influence on the nasal in front of it to change it. And how are we changing it? We're changing alveolar to velar, so we're changing the place of articulation. And then we have three different cases of assimilation in one single word.